Uh, hello everybody, it's James here and it's Ask Dutch Anything, episode 35. We're going to do the very, very quick version of the plugs as we always do on Ask Dutch Anything. There is a University of Dutch cap. Dutch has a few of those that he is willing to sign for you and send to you for a price. You go to Dirty Dutch Mantel at 2Ls at gmail.com. Uh, sorry, at, with 2Ls at gmail.com. He also yep. has books for sale. He has two. Uh, signed, go to Dirty Dutch Mantel with 2Ls at gmail.com. Unsigned, go to Amazon. Same with my two books on Owen Hart and The Rock. He also has diplomas. He also has uh, the baseball, uh, not baseball, the trading cards that we discussed on the last episode that we may be doing up for an auction. There is one example of it. So, uh, the big thing to say is questions for Dutch at gmail.com. And everybody whose question I'm going to read out has done just that. And when I keep saying, goodness me, we get a lot of questions in, I, say, I mean it. We seem to get records of questions in every single week. You know, we're getting like 100 or something every single week. It's ridiculous amounts coming in. But this first person, as everybody has, has done so doing that questions for dutch at gmail.com and first person is mike rolfs hey dutch hey james i've been watching wwe and wwf from 1986 to 1995 for the past year or so what i've noticed is just as many guys not selling moves just as much as the guys today do you think the criticism of new guys and gals not selling is fair i have several examples if needed well it started somewhere and uh I think back in those days, they said you only had like five minutes. So do as much stuff as you can do. And so if guys go out there and they're just trying to do moves, yeah, uh, you had a, a limited number uh, amount of time on TV back in, in those days. So you try to go out there and I guess do a lot of stuff because – Nothing is worse than a five-minute match that nothing happens. But now, since they have longer matches, especially I've been noticing this on Raw, but not lately, but, you know, they had a little time to sell more. But you, I never know what kind of instruction they're getting in the, in the, in the back in the back. So, yeah, it's always been a thing in wrestling no selling a move or a punch or a kick or this, that, and the other. But uh, if I watch, I watch a, a little bit of a Japanese wrestling, they don't fly all over the place, but they do beat the crap out of each other. So when they're doing that, it's not hard to sell. Really. If a guy's really ringing your bell or giving you those chops, you know, it's not hard to sell. And the people are right with it because they can hear it. So that's a little bit different. Yeah, it, we had the same problem back then. I think it's a it's a, a problem through the years, and I think if you if if wrestling is still with us in a hundred years, it'll be the same thing. Next question, John. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce your surname. Gear, uh, Gear I think. Uh, big fan of the show. Big fan of Dutch. I've had the books that you shamelessly shill since they <laughs> originally released. Great. No, reads, whoa, by whoa, the way. it's. Uh, now they're writing in and knocking me no, to no, my no. face. He says, great shamelessly. Reads. Great reads, shameless. he says. Oh, it is. They are great reads. But now he said, shamelessly hawk like I'm in a carnival. Is that what he's trying to say? Hey, What's his you, name? Uh, John. All right, John. You There's sell a, a lot of them. Uh, quite a bit more than I thought I would. Mm -hmm. so the but, once a story, but once a story is a story, it's a classic. And it's a classic that can be, and, and, you know, I keep talking about story and wrestling. Well, if you write a book, you got to tell a story. So every chapter is a different story, different people, different surroundings, different time. What I like about my book, well, other than I wrote it and I get money from it, is that it doesn't follow a linear uh you know, introduction. It doesn't start in 1986 and go 87 and then 88. It doesn't go in a line like that. You may start reading it and it's 1984 and then you pop up and it's 1998. I'm in Puerto Rico or somewhere. So every story stands stands alone on it on itself. So 
But what is a John Sto- uh, question? <clears throat> well, if you want those books, you can go to Dirty Dutch Man Tell with two L's at gmail.com and get them signed. <laughs> uh, hey, okay. that is that that was shameless. Yes. Now, John, that's shameless. But I do it a little bit more uh, courteously, I think. Mm. So, but th- that is a shameless plug. So what what was his uh well, uh, what was his question? John has a question about the IWA. This is my first time yep. really seeing a lot of it. I followed it in the Observer at the time, but seeing some of the houses they drew was amazing. Packed baseball stadiums, etc. Very impressive to see for a company that isn't talked about much. Based on what I've seen with the houses, was the pay good for the wrestlers, and was there a lot of heat slash competition with WWC, which was Carlos Colon's promotion at the time? <clears throat> yeah, we had some heat, but it's not they drew. It was, I drew, I booked all those cards. We drew all that money because, and the reason we, we, we drew money is because I told them, I said, listen, I'm not going to book it. And you guys to come along behind me and change it. I said, so I know exactly what I'm doing. You know what I'm doing. You don't got to worry about it. And he was right. We did have some, I mean, some, I mean, mega, mega houses, mega. We go to the baseball stadium and we had a good, strong TV and everybody was watching it because what was I heavy on, James? Story, back, story, backstage, out nobody of the said, stuff. Nobody said we had a five-star match, but we did, we turned in some, I, I think, $200,000 gates. Maybe not that, 150000 I'll, I'll say that. But, and how was the pay? Pay wasn't that good. It, it really wasn't. I had a guarantee, so, and I got, I got bonused a couple of times. But, but the pay wasn't that good. And, yeah, the, and we had IWA was the name of the company. And the regular company there was called WWC, World Wrestling Council. And I used to work with them, and then I had a, a falling out over money. Who would think such a thing would come in the way of business, money? But uh, and then I didn't, I didn't actively pursue going to IWA. They they came after me, and I gave them a number of what I wanted per week. Plus, they pick up my room and paid for my transportation. So. But I, I I did very well there, and and finally when I left, the guys were saying. But but I had the story kind of laid out. All they had to do was just follow it. But about I guess eight weeks after I left, you could see those houses going boop and and boop and boop because the same creative wasn't behind it. I'm not saying it's me. You are, but I but what I am kind of. But I always put a little bit of comedy in there and some humor in there, and I think that was missing or whatever. And but but it still did well. But as it come out that uh, Victor Quinones was the was the owner of that company, and I think he he OD'd because when I took it over, he said he was losing ten thousand a week. I don't know how. That's what he said he was he was losing. But and they found him dead in his in his house one day. But I saw that how he was living, he was really he was really drinking a lot and taking a, a lot of pills. So I told Samuel one day, I said, Man, he needs he needs to stop that. He may he may be the next one to go. And he said, Don't say that, don't say that. So I went home and went to work back to work for, no, I didn't go back to work. I, w- I went to work for TNA. Then I heard about eight months later that, that he had, they found him dead in his house and mm-hmm. he, he had OD'd. So April the 2nd, 2006. So a, a little longer, but it was so much. A little, it yeah. was okay. I started there in 2000. I think I left in 2003. Yeah. So it was, it was three years, but you know, when you see somebody doing that and they're acting differently and they, they don't look good, so you can't – and I couldn't envision uh, Victor sustaining that lifestyle. 
indefinitely and he and he didn't so but we did have some mega mega houses went outside the same house that uh wwe raw was in i think when they went to puerto rico i think it was that same house same crowd the it was a big big indoor stadium uh, not indoor indoor arena but we filled it up they filled it up so but if you're following a story which is what we did because my wrestling wasn't five-star wrestling mm -hmm. <laughs> it was all story and but the people kept buying tickets and kept coming to see it. The, uh, the uh, Coliseo de Puerto Rico, Jose Miguel Agrilot. I've probably butchered the pronunciation there, but that's what the uh, venue was called. Well, for it was probably it, it was probably a, a different venue, <clears throat> yeah. but it was right next. It was they may have torn the old building down and put another one up, but yeah. we was in the, we were in the same place where the other building was. So I I don't know how many would hold, but we have sold it out before. Yeah, broke ground in 1998, apparently, this new building. And uh, built 98 to 2004. Anyway, um, did Carlos ever try and lure you back while you were working for IWA or even after? Well, he never really talked to me since that time. And they had another... Uh, if I tell that Puerto Rican story, it'll take, it'll take a whole podcast. But Carlos had a partner named Jovica. And he was from, where was he from? Was it Croatia or something? Croatia. So him speaking English was a chore. And him speaking Spanish was a chore because he didn't get either one of them right. Oh, and he, he, had, he had a voice like this. Hey, Dutch, how are you? I am fine. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes I wanted to kill him. I, I really did. And, but, but he knew how to run business. He, he did that. He was, he was a kind of a, 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 a hard head, but, and he's had some good years down there in Puerto Rico too. I don't know if he's, I guess he's still involved with it. IWA is still going, mm -hmm. you know, they had a couple of territories when Vince and company, this is back in the old Vince days when the WWF first started to move, they started taking all the moms and pops over. That's what I call the regular territories. And, uh, but they never could take over Puerto Rico. You know, Hogan talks about the times he went to Puerto Rico and it sold out. He didn't he sell drew out. Nothing when he it drew out. like 1500 yep. people or something. And, but to hear him tell it, Oh, it was a, Brother, it was a sellout every night, blah, blah, blah. No, it, it didn't. So, but when when I was there, they liked tough-ass wrestling. All this wrestling you see now in like AEW and all that, you know, controlled wrestling, nah. Because you didn't pay enough. Sometimes you would get in the ring and... <laughs> Actually, I told two guys to get in there and let the best man win. I told two guys. <laughs> they were from down there. One come back with a bloody nose. The other come back with a busted eye. <laughs> I didn't book them again. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was always really, really a good, good uh, area for wrestling. But you had to watch it if you were a heel. Because those people thought that wrestling was real. And the space program was fake. So when you come out of that ring, you better have your head on a swivel. You know, sometimes they would be coming. And when you get in the ring, people would pick up rocks or they would take their Coke cans and drink all the Coke out, leave the ice in it, and make a ball and throw it. And they play baseball year round in Puerto Rico. So they had hellacious arms. I never really got hit by anything. Uh, I did get hit by a rock one time, and I left the ring, and, oh, they got so mad at me. Why are you leaving? Why are you leaving? I said, I'm not standing out there, guys, and be at our damn target practice for those guys. I said, you either put security or I'm not doing it. And from then on, they had some security to stop those people from throwing this stuff. See, if one person throws and nobody stops them, 
Well, that gives the second guy, well, I'm going to throw this. Then all of a sudden you're out there. It's like damn a biblical stoning. Mm -hmm. They could stone you to death out there and nobody would think anything about it. They just say, you need to watch yourself. <laughs> that would be Joe, Joe Vick has answered me. You need to watch yourself up there. So, but anyway, but yeah, we, uh, the bit, the money wasn't good. We had to turn over. We had just regular guys there and, but we still did good business. And we did four hours a week of TV. Nice. That's a lot of, that's, that's a lot of TV without a lot of talent. Yeah. Next question, Paul H. from Salisbury, Wiltshire. Do you think that The Undertaker and Sting would eventually come out of retirement to do a one-off match? One last dance, one last match for an overdue, the Phenom versus the Icon match. That is all in the wrestling world would have wanted and needed throughout their careers and should have happened by now. There's been times in your prime that it would have been an amazing once-in-a-lifetime attraction. You reckon it's a massive missed opportunity for The Undertaker and Sting. Really like the show and a new fan of the show. What's this guy's name? Paul. Well, Paul, let me tell you, buddy. What I'd like to see an Undertaker and uh, a Sting match. In 2024. Last match, in 2024. What I want to see it. Again, this is my stock answer. Not no, but hell no. I wouldn't want to see it. Because they're both good guys. They're both baby faces. So... You have nobody to really, I mean, half of them would cheer Sting, half of them would cheer Undertaker, which is the hardest match ever. And don't even don't even try to envision trying to put this match together because it would be nothing. I mean, the people would just sit there and watch it. Yeah, it sounds great, but I don't think the people are going to be falling head over heels to buy tickets or buy pay-per-views to see it. But then that's not even your biggest, your biggest question. Because the next question is who wins? Who goes over that? No matter who goes over, you're going to piss the other half off. So now the thing with Sting that he recently had with AEW was, was done pretty well, except for some, extravagant spots by Darby Allen, which weren't needed, but he put them in. It, it didn't hurt, but, but was staying in undertaker, which one would agree to lose? Huh. Neither one of them would. So that's your first hurdle. You got to get over. And then what are you going to pay them? See these guys of, of in, in that type of, uh, atmosphere they want top dollar and i don't know if anybody could afford top dollar for them they could but i don't know but do i think it would be a, a big a big money generator no i do not i don't i think you, one is enough i think sting did it right and undertaker if he did the last match I think he'd want to do it the way he's won all his matches. I think he'd want to cross her arms and put them in the casket and let them ride. And then you put the camera on him and you go. See, everybody's happy then. But if you put both of them together, they I think they'd have a crappy match. Yeah. The, the, their combined age would be 114 years between them. <laughs> So that you know, that's a lot that's of age social security. That's a social security match. Yeah, I know. Yeah, free bus pass on a pole. Yeah, match or something like that. Uh, do you know what? Right, I'm thinking historically here. I mean, a few years ago, the Undertaker wrestled Goldberg. I think they were both good guys. It was an unmitigated disaster for a number of different reasons, apart from the fact you know just age and it just didn't. It just everything went wrong, and somehow it wasn't that big of a deal because they were both good guys as well. And I'm even looking further back. Like Bruno San Martino and Pedro Morales, I'm sure, like did a stadium show, and it wasn't that great because they were both good guys. And at some point, the fans are going to cheer one more than the other. So all you're doing is splitting the audience when you want to keep well, them both popular. You got you got two guys standing there, not knowing what to do. Both of them are not wanting to turn heel in front of the crowd. This is their allegedly. There's that word again. We use it every show. Allegedly, their last match. And I think unmitigated disaster, I think that was that would what uh, Undertaker and, and uh, Sting would be. 
Next question. Rick Miller from Kentucky says, Hey, Dutch and James, hope you're both doing well. I'd like to ask Dutch if he remembers Dr. Ken Ramey and his interns. If so, could he tell us about them? Well, I never met Ken Ramey, or if I did, it was just a brief meeting. But I don't remember meeting him. And his interns, they were they were different guys at different times. But I heard a lot about him. I heard he, they had a lot of heat. Uh, but I never worked any shows with them. And like I said, I never met him. So I'm, I'm sure they, they worked some shows where they got enough heat to had a riot. So that's what you don't want in wrestling. You don't want a riot. You want them at least to be tame enough to accept it and go go home instead of trying to knock your windows out in your car and, and throw bricks at you. Uh, you don't want to leave a town like that. Next question then. Jimmy from uh, from Oklahoma says, Hey, Dutch, in 2013, around the time you started your run with Swagger, the WWE were pushing social media on their shows nonstop. I'm sure things have changed a bit since then, but I have a few questions on the topic. Number one, did you run your own Twitter page or was it someone else? We'll do it one question at a time. So uh, did you always run your own Twitter page when you became Zeb? Yep, I always did that. Did, uh, they did... had no... They had no... They didn't even ask me, didn't even get in contact with me about what I had on the page or anything. No guidelines? Nothing. Did, did he send you like promotional stuff to post on their behalf or just, that was it? Nope. Nope. Number two, uh, did WWE have, oh, well, there you go, uh, any rules for social media back then? So for you, uh, no, they didn't. Number three, when the boys did WWE Inbox, which we'll talk about in a minute, a backstage Q&A show on YouTube. Who would uh, who would ask you to be a part of it? Was it planned uh, like on Mondays you need to shoot stuff for the WWE YouTube page? Or was it at random, hey, you do it this week and just turn up? So how would you be chosen for internet-based stuff like that? Well, you, you sent me this question, and I'm thinking, what's the name of it? Uh, WWE inbox. You didn't even remember the segment, did you? I, no, I don't even remember. I don't even remember anything being the inbox. I think, what the hell is the inbox? You know, you do certain things in WWE. I've done interviews for places. They say, oh, it's Sri Lanka. I said, what? Sri Lanka. I guess it's off the coast of India. S R S R I Lanka. It's off the coast of India, right? Yeah. I didn't know Sri Lanka from damn Augusta, Georgia. I, d I didn't know the difference. But you would do things like that for different outlets, just especially for them. And they wanted me to do one, like in Germany, they wanted me to speak with a German accent. I went, guys, hell, I have hard enough time speaking with a Southern accent. And I grew up with it. But, but I did it. I did it the best I could. But the inbox, I had no idea what it was. And till you, till you brought it up to me, then I remembered it. But I don't remember doing the interviews for it. So I wonder, were these interviews used individually or they didn't put them all together at one time, did they? Oh, no, yeah. All those videos are just for a, a YouTube uh, exclusive, it seems. Uh, very. We'll show a, a quick clip of it in a second, but... Let's say on a typical episode of Raw, you get there. Yeah. How much yeah. work would you do before the actual show started? So how no, you, how many promos would you do and whatever else backstage vignettes? Well, you would do you would do some, but nowhere near what you would used to do. You used to get there for the Monday night show, Raw or whatever they called it. <coughs> you would have like. 30 interviews to do. Like if you were going to say you were going to uh, Birmingham, Alabama, they'd want you to do a localized commercial for Birmingham, just strictly Birmingham, name the building, the time, who you're resting, what's going to happen. And then all of a sudden they say, okay, Birmingham's over. Okay. Tampa, we're doing to Tampa and they'd have you the information. And you, you'd have to do all those detailed uh, interviews like that. Take you forever to do them. And you weren't the only one doing them. They would have sometimes four crews going. And it was as fast as you could get them out. Hmm. And that to me is when the quality suffers. Because 
It was just hurry up and get them done. Hurry up and get them finished. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry, hurry up. And sometimes you didn't do your best interview because it was changing on you all the time. And yeah, it, was, it used to be a be a lot tougher. Now, since they have a Raw on USA Network and you know on the, and SmackDown on what are they on on Fox, you don't got to do all that stuff. They do the local advertising, which I think works out better for them anyway. But yeah, but this inbox thing, I think this was just for internet, right? Yep. And in fact, why don't we just watch a quick one now? So one second, I'll tell you. Okay, then. And we're recording. So have you ever considered going to a facial hair convention and entering the mustache competition? What is your response? Yes, I have considered going to a mustache con convention and entering it. And... Uh... As a matter of fact, I'm going uh, to one, I think, in July, and then I'm going to one in August. One's in San Francisco and one's in Dallas. And I fully expect, 100%, to walk away uh, either the winner or with a contract, an advertising contract in my hand. Is that true? Did you ever go to a <laughs> to a mustache convention? No, no, I didn't. I never did. You, you were really convincing. Uh, but, but I lied. But you see, oh, no, no. I can't say that. I can't say that. I was booked for a a convention in San Francisco and in Dallas. I was booked for it, but somehow it got changed at the last moment. Mm. So, but hey, look at this. This 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 should win something. Listen, if there's any anybody uh, with a mustache company, we are open open for offers to advertise your mustache wax or any of your hair products. I think with this thing of beauty here, I think it would, if you just got the wrestling fans buying your stuff, I think that's, that's, that's quite an accomplishment and an increase in sales, I might add. Mm -hmm. Don't you think, James? Yeah, absolutely. And who would not want to sponsor that mustache? Who knows? We might get someone interested. That'd be good. Right. And some free product for you as well. We're going to move hey, on. No, no we're hey, not. My, my next thing I'm going to start selling is Dutch's mustache wax. It comes autographed. <laughs> <laughs> you go to Dirty Dutchman Tail with two L's at gmail.com and ask me. <laughs> God, so you need a website, I'm telling you, just so people can I do, I do. Well, I brought this up. I need a website, but I don't need anybody charging me a lot of money for it. I just need, I actually, I think I need like a, what do you call that thing? A it's sucker. not a web. <laughs> a sucker to <it> free. <laughs> no, it's already halfway put together. I just can't keep it straight. Yeah, you need a and webmaster. Is there a webmaster out there? Get in touch with Dutch at Dirty Dutchman Tell Two Hours at Gmail.com. Yeah, and don't charge me an arm and a leg, you know, because one guy said, oh, I'll do it for 500 I'll do it for that. Hell, I'll learn it for that <laughs> if you're going to charge me that much. And what is that other thing that's is, is usually a one page deal? What's that called? I don't know, like a blog kind of thing? Or? A blog, a blog, a absolutely. Hell, I could get by with just a blog. No, but you can't put the, like, the links and stuff in there, you know, with the automatic why pages. Why, why, why can't I put links in blogs? I don't know. Well, you know, like a, like a nice shop front page kind of thing. I don't. You can't do that with a blog, I don't think. You need I a proper website. A All right, anybody, and some guys contacted me, and they said, oh, we won't charge you much. Hey, I'm a wrestler. You know my magic word? Right. Yeah, absolutely. If Rassies. it's free, you may <laughs> you may have the job. Or not free, but you know, something within reason, you know. So but I do have I do have a, a website out there, dirty dust at uh dot com. What? Oh it's dirt dirty dirty dust com. That's yeah. what it is. But it's but it's but a, it's a it's, dead it's, website, it's, essentially it needs sorting out. Yeah, it, it it needs a lot. It needs some life breathed into it. So, all right, come on, you uh, internet heads out there, you website heads, help me out here. Help an old boy, like old Tommy Rich used to say, help old country boy out here. <laughs> right, we're going to move on. This is your favorite question, I believe, submitted this week. Charles says, my favorite wrestling memory involves Freebirds versus the Rock and Roll Express at a WCW house show. 
we fans just about booed the Express out of the building, cheered the birds as if they were Hulk Hogan. The crowd reaction was completely the opposite of what was expected. So somehow, without any of us realising it, it, uh, it was happening, the two teams just switched parts in the performance. The Express became the cheating heels, keeping the free birds from tagging out, whereas the birds became the faces who couldn't catch a break from the ref. So the question is, has Dutch ever been in a match where the crowd reaction to the wrestlers was so against the plan that he spontaneously assumed the opposition role? Heel to face, face to heel, etc. In order to deliver a crowd-pleasing match. Thanks again, Dutch and James. Yes, I have. Actually, several times. <clears throat> Sometimes when you get in the ring, let's say a, a, a crowd kind of knows me or they're familiar with me. Another guy gets in there and he looks rougher than I do. <clears throat> sometimes they like me better than him. Oh, saying in wrestling, don't go against the grain. Don't go against the crowd because then you're just, you, you're working to achieve a goal that you're not going to get to. If they're going to buy me as a good guy, well, then I'm going to play that role. And if the other guy is smart, he'll become the heel and we'll have a match. Because never fight the crowd because that's the worst thing you can do. So, again, if, if they took me as a good guy, I'm going to be the good guy. The other guy, if he'll adjust and be a heel, yeah, we're okay. Fine. So, and they did the right thing. I bet they had a hell of a match. Because baby faces, they always, I don't know what it is, they always, for some reason, want to be heels. For one match anyway. And I can see Robert and... and Robert and them just going crazy being a heel. And I, I can see, I can see the free birds being, you know, baby faces because, and they were good baby faces too, if they had good heels, but I would have liked to have seen that match because, uh, I think they would have turned it on. And if they knew I was watching, they'd really turn it on. So, but, uh, Robert and, and Ricky, they're like heels, wannabes you know if <laughs> they wanted to transition to heel but they didn't want to stay heels all the time you know why they didn't sell any pictures <laughs> they didn't sell any gimmicks so them being good guys they could sell their gimmicks and get paid for it. do you know i uh with the uh currently on hiatus shane Dillers podcast we watched a match the Free Birds versus the Dynamic Dudes, and I think it was somewhere in the North. It probably was Philly or somewhere near there, or whatever it was. And the crowd hated, hated the Dynamic Dudes for a number of reasons. You I'll know, the, tell you why. The stupid, I hated them too. Yeah, the stupid gimmick that was completely skateboards. Yeah, the skateboard thing, and it was it was so phony for what it was. And you know, Shane will tell you the same thing. And um, they were <laughs> against the Free Birds, and. The crowd loved the Freebirds. And in this yes. match, the Freebirds just went with it and they just started taunting, you know, playing to the crowd. The crowd loved them. Dynamic dudes just got booed even worse. But there was there was something about but they didn't switch. You know, Shane Douglas still made the babyface comeback or whoever did, you know, and um so it's sort of almost like a halfway turn to just make sure that the dynamic well, dudes got as buried as humanly possible. They were also working for WCW. Yes. Is that it? Or? Yeah, uh, this was 89, I think. Yeah. Well, they probably had an agent watching them there, and they would have known if they'd come out of the ring, what did you guys do? And he would report it back to the office. And <clears throat> they were a lot of factors you've got to consider there. But I think they got through it the easiest way they could. But I can see uh, your boy, uh, I mean, Laurinaitis, He's not I my mean, boy, Shane. Uh, Shane, I'm sorry. I don't know where I got Laurinaitis. But uh, it was Laurinaitis in that. With the, yeah, yeah, with Shane. It, yeah, yeah. It, Shane and him. It was Laurinaitis, yeah. But that was a that was a heat that was a heat seeking gimmick. Here you got two guys and you know, and skateboarders, they're little smart asses anyway. And so I could see how they could be heels. I don't know why they didn't make them heels, tell you the truth. They would have been much, much better at heels because both of them got that heel mindset anyway, especially Shane, you know. Well, he'd, so, he'd, never, he'd never done it at that point. He'd only been a baby face, but I think he'd only been in, you know, the major leagues a couple of years. He was an import from the UWF at that point. So I th he was only turned heel. When who's UWF? 
Bill Watts, Mid South. Oh, okay. when it came That's to what. <clears throat> <clears throat> Listen, if you got three letters that you're not using, just form a wrestling company and somebody will buy it. As long as it's got W in there. <laughs> X, J, Q, W. W, that's yeah. it. And the just thing, put it think of the for, Scrabble for, points you could get with, yeah, the, with the promotion. Yeah, like just, that. and just put it up out there for sale. And you can sell it for like a hundred bucks, but it's a hundred bucks more than you had. If so Larry, put it up if there. If Larry Burton's in, in the room. He might buy it off you for five hundred grand. Uh, you had to bring his name up, right? Well, one of his names, yeah. God, we'll leave much. Larry. But Bur- we'll leave Larry Burton for there. We're going to uh, move on. Tyson Hadley has written in and says, "What did you think of Victoria?" Uh, this is a uh, Lisa Marie Veron. I always enjoyed her work and her gimmick of being a crazy psycho. What happened in TNA with her and Dixie Carter having a fallout? Uh, he also asks. I read she spent six thousand dollars of her own money to promote a TNA show at Chicago at her own pizza restaurant. Dixie knew Victoria had a restaurant, and then uh, and and the other talents had parties there when they came down. Just for Dixie to say, "Yeah, I heard of it," but two TNA office people sent an email to the whole roster telling the roster to promote another pizza joint in the area, and saying this is the best pizza of my life ever. When Victoria found out, she went to Bruce Pritchard and said, "The day I leave this job is the day I'm punching that see you and see you next Tuesday in the face." Talking about Dixie. So two questions there. One. Your, uh, she was Tara, wasn't she in TNA at the time? Yes. Yeah. So uh, your stories about Tara, uh, Victoria, and also her heat with Dixie. Good girl. I I I loved her working working with her and around her. <clears throat> Easy to talk to, you know. She got my humor too, so she liked that. And I would have actually paid money to see her punch Dixie right in the mouth. <laughs> Now, this was after I probably left TNA, I think, because I was I was there when uh, Victoria was there, and I always enjoyed, enjoyed being around her. But I don't know why that would have – if she spent money to help the show, why all of a sudden the turn by Dixie all of a sudden? Because another pizza place wanted to advertise with her? Yeah, apparently so. I'm not even sure advertise, just, just – I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know either. But six thousand dollars to add, you know, to help out TNA only for Dixie to turn around well, and say stuff here. Well, we need a little backstory on that. I'd like to have her on the show and ask her that. Mm. You know, I don't think we've had a lady on the show yet, have we? A female? And we have not had a lady on. I'd love to have Victoria on. I tried to get her on yeah, WSI and she uh, never, she had never got a response. So, but maybe you, you the silver tongued Dutch yeah, Mantel might be able to get her to come on. You got a number on her. That would help. That would help. I've got an email. You can try. I'll send it to you. We'll, we'll, send, we'll send that to me. I'd love to have her on the show. Because mm. I saw her somewhere. Where did I see her at? At some show. I don't know. It was like over two years ago. It's one of those shows that I showed up and I didn't actually work the show. I was just a special guest of the show. Which I like better. I don't. I like to be the special guest because you can sit back there and talk to people. And you know, when I go to a convention or I go to a signing or something, you know, there's a lot of other guys around, and people ask me. They say, "Hey, you know, you, you should love these conventions because you get to see all the the friends you used to have, and you know, you get to talk to them. And what do you enjoy the most?" I said, "Well, actually, I enjoy the fans more than I do the guys." Cause I couldn't stand half of them when I, <laughs> when I was still working. So, but actually the fans are, they got great stories plus they're new and they'll tell you a story or two. And, you know, once you see the guy, Hey, how you doing? What's going on? This, that, and the other, well, hell it's over then, you know, cause you didn't know him that, that close. You knew him, but you, and work with him, but you didn't really know him. Uh, most of the guys, because, you know, you just work with more or less a certain s- set of talent anyway. But the fans, I always enjoy them better than I do the guys. Strange, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you only spent a few months, really, with TNA before you were let go uh, with with uh, Victoria Tara. Uh, right, okay. Are you a big fan of spiders? Uh, no. Whose idea was it to give her a tarantula? Well, one my idea. 
because because that was phew, turn the TV off kind of stuff for me. She put it on. She yeah. put it on. Was it Slick Johnson's body or something once? You know the the in shape referee guy. Okay, yeah, I wasn't there long with her because I think she came later on. I left in two thousand nine. She joined in two thousand nine, May. Okay, and I wasn't there with her long. Maybe I think two months. Then I was, I was out of there, big time. Mm. So we need to. We need. Of course, to I, 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 I guess, I guess they got tired of me sitting in catering all the time. But my contribution sitting in catering was much more than I could have done out there doing something else. I didn't listen anyway. <laughs> my my big contribution to TNA was a knockout division. So there you go. that did well. That did very very good. Yeah, we definitely need Victoria on. Right, I'll I'll work on it and I'll and I'll see what I can do. Uh, right, next question is Nick. Hey Dutch, have you ever worked with Fit Finley or have any good stories regarding him? Thanks. Well, I met him in WWE, and I never worked with him, and he wasn't working anyway. But I do remember one one time somebody wasn't there, and he came, and I think he put his wrestling outfit on and went out there and actually turned in a pretty good match for somebody who hadn't been in the ring for like six months or eight months. Went out there, and he did a credible match. So my hat's off to him for, for doing that. Because once you stay out of the ring uh, six months longer, it gets harder and harder to get back in that ring. Because your body is saying, uh-uh, we're not doing this crap again. No, no. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to, you know, you're not used to taking the bumps. And so your body has to be conditioned to take those bumps. And if it's not conditioned, then you will get up next morning, you won't be able to walk. See, wrestlers take that into... They take that for granted. People take it for granted, to tell you the truth. But you, I want you to tell me one person that can get in that ring and just fall straight down and not feel it the next day. Mm. Very, very few can. So, but yeah, fit. I didn't. I, I never went out with him. Never knew him that well. Uh, but treat, treated me good though. He is sort of the WWE version of you, in a sense. When you were in TNA, you mentioned just before the knockouts division, you were a, a big proponent of having the women out there and actually be wrestlers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they turned in great ratings. Fit was sort of the same WWE's version, or even WWF at the time, because I think he came in right after WCW closed. And then he trained the women. And mm -hmm. he trained the women to not just be, you know, hair pulling and all that kind of thing. And, you know, his work with, you know, Trish and Lita and probably Victoria uh, uh, and, and, and others as well. You know, he's like the most respected agent among the women in WWE. What was he doing in WWE while you were there? General agent or did he have specific matches or still working with the women? Well, he would go on the road, I think. He was a house show uh, agent. Plus, when we went to TV, he was an agent for some of the matches. And, of course... He has that British background, which is basically more wrestling than it is hullabaloo. Uh, so he specialized in that. I like the way he did it because he had a rhyme and a reason for everything that was done. And sometimes now you can go to a wrestling school and guys can show taking a hip toss. They can do that. They can see how that's done. But they don't know why it's done or in what context it should be done. See, in a wrestling match, you've heard this enough story. You got to tell a story inside of a match and you tell that story, then you can kind of, once the people catch on to what the story is, you got them. Now you only got sometimes 10 minutes, 12 minutes to do it, but you can do it. It can be done. I've done it a hundred times, thousand times. But, but you got to move around. And that old saying, you got to feel the temperature in the room. I went to some, go down to some matches. I could have cut my head off and they wouldn't give a crap. And sometimes you just look at the guy and get a reaction. So you got to feel that. Sometimes when that happens, the crowd is really hot. The guys actually do too much. 
but that comes from experience that comes from seasoning and that comes to listening to veterans like me and uh, anybody else who is the agent. If you listen to them or if they will, they may learn something. We shall move on. A regular contributor, uh, George Carl Clearwater, Florida. Hi, Dutch and James. I was watching some video from Memphis, uh, 1984, 19th of May. In fact, he's very specific. And Dutch was incensed, giving a promo about Rick Rude punching and giving a backbreaker to Evelyn Stevens, or Evelyn Stevens, however you want to pronounce it, as she was in Dutch's corner with Angel in Rude's corner. I remember from my previous taping that I watched that Dutch was going to have Evelyn Stevens in his corner, and I had actually never heard of her before. Doing a little research, I did read that in 1986 she was arrested for blowing away her third husband. Blowing Dutch, away? Uh, or blowing? Uh, pro- pro- uh, first one, then the other, I imagine. Yeah, okay, I won't, okay, I won't okay. tell you which order. Dutch, okay. what can you tell us about Evelyn Stevens? Did you know very much about her? Any info on her? And did you work very much with her? Well, I'm going to be very truthful here as opposed to telling a lie. I don't even know who Evelyn Stevens is. I can't even remember the name. I can't even remember the face. I don't even remember what George is is talking about. But I'm sure if it's on video, it happened. But taking into the second uh, thing he named that, he read later, he did a little research on her, I guess, and she was, what, arrested and charged? For murder, for apparently, yeah. Killing her third husband? Hmm? Well, and what lesson did I learn from all this? Don't marry Evelyn Stanton. Because <laughs> <laughs> you might be the victim on that other end. Well, you never know. No, she might I'll, only kill the odd-numbered husbands. Well, maybe. Uh, so, But I don't know. I don't Evelyn Stevens, if you'd have said that name to me, which George did, I have no idea who he's talking about. I'm going to have to look it up. You got a photo of her? No, I can't even find a photo of her. I was just looking for one there. Right, Carl. Oh, uh, I know he will. Maybe, I know, I maybe, know he'll listen. Maybe, oh, George, I think you made this up. Yeah. <laughs> we're, going to turn, we're going to turn the yeah. tables on you, buddy. George Carl, right. Write back in and see if you can send us any footage of any of Evelyn Stevens and Dutch because we both want to know. Uh, yeah. Someone else actually wrote because we mentioned uh, Rick Rude and Angel. Next question is Byron Morris. Can you talk about your feud with Rick Rude? How was he as a worker? I had heard he was one of the strongest wrestlers in the ring. Thank you for your time and I love the podcast. <clears throat> Rick Rude when uh, he came to Memphis. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what Angel looks like. So who was Angel? Angel was a pretty girl. Really pretty girl. And she would she would go to the ring with him, and she didn't do too much. They were both green as grass, but I don't think Angel had any aspirations of going further in wrestling. Was, was she a girlfriend re- of his or wife? Yeah, or? it was his girlfriend. Yeah. I don't think it was his wife. I think it was his girlfriend. Pretty girl. And we did a few things with her, just simple stuff, but... We had to do simple stuff because Rick was just really getting started then. So basically what I was doing was training Rick Rude for his WWF run and WWE run. So, and yes, he was very, very strong. You looked at him and he was like, he wasn't all muscled up. I mean, there was I mean, no, they was not, I bet they wasn't 2% fat on that guy's body, 2% maybe. And he had, they said the strongest like punch, he could knock a guy out with, with just anybody with one punch. Cause the only other guy I ever saw that was Hillary Carl Cox. And he would hold it when he was coming back from the ring. He'd have so much heat. He'd have, he'd have his hands like this looking both sides. And then if somebody got that, he would just throw that, what they call that six inch punch. Bam. Guy's gone. Or the other side. One night in West Palm Beach, he he did something. I'm watching it. And I'm out there watching and all of a sudden. And West Palm Beach, the fans must have been so bad at one time. They had an actual uh, covering 
for the heels to walk out. And all it was, it was a collapsible like oh, tunnel. Like, like a canopy kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, and they would pull that out, <clears throat> and it had, uh, you know, like chicken wire on it or, yeah. you know, and then some and some canvas because they would stand over and, and throw, you know, cups down. So, but I'm watching him and he's trying to make his way there. And it was like, it wasn't that far from the ring where he had to get to, but I forgot what he did, but he did something to, I don't even know he did it to, but boy, the damnedest damn halfway fight broke out right when that part, he was coming back and he made it back and he said, damn, this job's getting harder. And he was laughing. This job's getting harder, kid. <laughs> and he, and I look back out there and there was two or three cops standing around and two or three guys, at least two guys were laying out and he knocked two of them out on the way back from the ring. I said, damn, but that's how, you know, fans used to be. They used to take this personally and it's not like today, like, oh, well, it's a, just make us feel good, put the baby face over and let's go this, that, and the other and, no, they believed it then, and you had to watch. You had to watch your back. You didn't have to watch your back as much as you had to watch your car, because <laughs> they would go and flatten your tires. They would put like stuff down in your gasoline tank. You know, you'd be going down the road, and all of a sudden, the car just stopped. Car the the engine's ruined. I mean, they and the windshield's busted. It was, it was it was tough. A lot of times we would pull into an enclosed lot that had a guard on it. So your car was fairly safe. I didn't say it was hundred percent safe, but you know, these fans, they would go out of the way to get you back and you may not have known who, who did it, but they do. I'm so, just, I'm just looking but Evelyn, Evelyn Stevens, I'm still thinking about her. You, you can't pull up a picture of her. Cannot find one, but Rick, uh, you did wrestle in a mix match against Rick Rude and uh, Angel versus you and Evelyn I thought Stevens. that was 84. I thought that was I thought that was Joyce Grable Joyce Grable that's who I thought it was oh, it must be someone different right. she doesn't even have a, a no one okay right so it's 84 May 84 this uh, this is out someone find an image of her or give us some more information uh, what did Rick Rude we'll go back to Rick Rude what did Rick Rude do well in the early days. I know you're basically training him, but what was he well, doing? Well, he looked like a star. He'd get in the ring and he had a good body anyway. And the women loved him. He'd go over there and he'd do that, the hip movement, the Elvis hip movement back and forth. And they liked that. See, this is what I liked about the women and their husbands. You know, the woman say, Oh, I hate wrestling. I don't want to go to wrestling. She says, Cause she goes down there and, and she sees guys like Rick Rude, and all of a sudden her interest personally grows. Mm -hmm. But to the husband, no, she still hates it. But she liked when Rick Rude. I used to call it. Uh, it was burlesque for females, is what it was. And they would go and see half naked guys. And they'd get all sweaty and you know, but they would always tell the guy, oh, "I don't, I don't like this." So. These women getting over. But anyway, I, I think he was getting what he needed to do to be a heel. And I think he learned you don't have to constantly beat on a baby face to get a reaction. He would go outside the ring, get a kiss from, what was the name of his ballet? Angel. Yeah, he would go out and he would get a kiss from her, which would piss the guys off, piss the women off too, because they wanted to be kissing him. But... But but he was learning how to be a heel, and and I taught him everything I knew, and then he would work with Lawler, and he would learn the timing with Lawler, and he would work with some more baby faces, and he would learn a little bit from all of us. And then the next thing I know, he's in New York, he's in WWF. He was in um, he was in Crockett at the same time you were in '86, I think, or '87, one of those things. He Rick Manny, Rude, yeah, he was Manny Fernandez's tag team partner, and then just one day he just disappeared, just left. I don't know. Maybe he was there. You you may have even wrestled him. I don't know. Maybe. 
Maybe I you don't and Bobby know. Jaggers. Who knows? Okay, well we'll figure that out. I think we've got <laughs> we've got time for one or two. Brother, I, I got more empty spots in his head. I don't remember him even being in Crockett. Well, I don't even remember Evelyn Stevens. Guys, listen. When you send me our people, listen. When you send me, do I know somebody? Try to make it within the last twenty years at least. Because this this dementia hits hard sometimes. <laughs> I don't want to be demonstrating it to a damn. 115,000 people. He was in Florida in 85 as well. Hang on. Let me just have a look. What time? He was uh, He was there in February 85. 85, I went down there to take the book over. And yeah. I took it over in 84. And I stayed like eight months or something. And then Eddie Graham killed himself. And I mm. said, I've had enough of this. He, he was there in the middle of 85. So there's a good chance that even for a couple of weeks, you did book him. There you go. What months? January 85, he started. So, yeah, you could have had him. You probably will, yeah. will have had him for a few weeks or a month or two. Uh, his first one was uh, Pez Watley. Well, that means means I would have had to book him. I don't remember booking Rick Rude. Now, after that, Wahoo took over, Wahoo McDaniel, and probably Wahoo booked him. When I was, don't know. When's the Super Bowl? Because I know, you know, with Eddie Graham. And Super Bowl. Bowl was in, I think, February. Yeah, so he, he was there in January. So you will have he, you will have booked him for a few weeks, maybe. So there okay. you go. Uh, right. We've either got one or two more questions in us before the time runs out. So Chris from Cherokee County, uh, Georgia. And I know you want to see this. Hey, guys, I love me some damn dirty with Dutch. Really, I could pick any clip of any episode, and it seems that you're having the time of your life, especially with Mr. Wonderful here. You really get into the promo with him. What I'm wondering is, is it possible that you enjoy doing interviews and announcing more than the actual wrestling? If I mean, how could you not? I mean, I mean, the interviews, are you don't get hurt, I guess. No, I enjoyed announcing. I, I really did, because I've seen announcers just go out there and hold the mic, and let the talent do a, do the whole interview. Well, with Mr. Perfect, I helped him out with it. Mr. Wonderful. Went back and forth. And Mr. Wonderful, he wasn't Mr. Perfect then, right? He was never Mr. Perfect. So, that was Kurt Hennig. You just had to show me up, didn't you? Okay, Mr. Wonderful. But he was, he was a good, he was a good interview. And you know what I didn't know about uh, Mr. Paul? He was a tremendous football player. Mm -hmm. Played at the University of Tampa, I think. And I think he went pro a couple of years. But, and I didn't know how tough he was too. He was a tough bastard too. So I think, did he get in a fight with uh, Vader? Was that it? Yeah. It's one of those stories that everyone on earth just happened to be in the locker room that day witnessing it, but... Uh, yeah, that's probably the most famous one. Well, but anyway, yeah, I did a good interview. I really enjoyed announcing and enjoyed announcing with Paul because he was full of shit too. So, and I <laughs> should, always should enjoyed being. It? Why don't we watch yeah, it? Let's watch it. I, I enjoy this interview. Okay, one sec. We're ready. And dirty with dirty Dutch. I'm dirty Dutch Mantel, and you're not. Who did that little drawing of you? The yeah. logo. Opinion, Who did it? Do you know? I don't know. Of Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And let's give a big hand right now to Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, please. Everybody put their hands together. <laughs> it's good, it's good as well because, like, when you're just doing the announcing, you don't have to, you know, get dressed up in the boots and the tights program. and stuff. Oh, yeah. You just put the poncho on and off you go. Bracket. And right here where that question <laughs> mark is right there, Mr. Wonderful, that's where your yeah. name should mm -hmm. be, but it's not. Now, I understand you want to come out here. I would like to ask you Did you ever notice the arm of Paul, you know, Bob after the, and your the, the neck issues that sort of killed all the nerves? Yeah, I, I did a little bit. First of all, let's analyze this whole situation. Okay? <laughs> we're going to analyze it now. I don't know what analyzing means. Is that we're going to try to explain it to you in very simple terms. Because we do have a lot of simple <laughs> people out there. That's what a redneck is. Absolutely. A redneck is a very simple person. Right. So here we go. Now, <laughs> Barry Orowitz just hanging out like a fart in yeah. the background. Yeah. That's yeah. Bob Armstrong right. to use the pile driver. Right. The pile driver is known world. No, I mean, I have beaten every man that's a wrestler that calls himself a wrestler. I have beaten them with it. 
You've seen it. I've seen it. You've seen Hulk yes, Hogan, yes. Tito Santana, you whooped them like Rick a dog. Flair. You just name them. Right. The list goes on and on and on. But you know something else? Now, here we go. Now we're going to start picking this thing apart. How come <laughs> they can use a DDT? How come they can use a figure four? How come they can use an H-bomb? Conspiracy, that's H-bomb. why. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. You are a smart man. Thank you. And that's why you're doing what you're doing. And those people out there are making $1.75 an hour. Now, that's let me why. Ask, let me ask you this. Brian Lee, he didn't beat you, did he? Who? Brian Lee. How can you win a belt on a disqualification? I don't know. Tell me about it. You're in the Smoky Mountains. You're in the Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and anything is possible here. It's the Smoky Mountain Ripoff. That's, what That's it exactly is. what it is. <laughs> Bob Armstrong is behind it. Brian Lee ain't a man. No, he tells it. He tells himself a man. I would not call myself a man winning the belt the way that he wanted. I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> I am a man. Everybody out there, every man sitting in that seat would love to be Mr. Wonderful. Well, ain't nothing. Nothing. nothing He's a garbage. <laughs> Wait a minute. I don't hey, know what did Brian Lee just fall over? Get over there, Barry. Yeah. I, oh, they always been. Oh, they're holding yeah. him back. I've never seen that done. Don't let him in here. Oh. Okay, get him out of here. That's Bob. That's Bob. Yeah. Danny Davis. I don't know who that hey, other guy is. Back. Don't go away, fans. We'll have more right after this. There we go. Yeah, that was a pretty good interview. Yeah, you don't do but, like that anymore. And we like, we don't know. <laughs> do you know? Do you know but what? To, it's one of those things where you just think. I bet that neither of you had, did. You talk at all before you went out there? Not really. I said, I'm, "I got you in an interview," and he said, "Yeah, I know." And I said, "I'll well, just do your stuff," and he said, "Okay," and that's it. And then when I did that, he did that. So we just back and forth. <laughs> we, no, we didn't even talk about it. But because that's the way we used to do it anyway. Because there's no need to they, they no need to talk that one over anyway. It's going to be what it is, and it'll serve the same purpose. Whoa. I should have turned to Barry Horowitz and says, "Great interview, Barry." <laughs> he just stood there. What was he doing? Was he backing uh, you up, or was what was he? No, doing? I think he was. He was going to be in some kind of a, a, a match with with Paul. I think they were coming up next or something. But I've never seen a guy held out of getting into the ring. Seemed like he would have let him in there and let him go at it, and then we all pull him apart. So anyway, I don't know what was going to happen. That was that was years ago too. No, Brian Lee needs to be disqualified for the zoo bag. Absolutely, he was Ab- absolutely. Uh, we're going to do one very quick question, then we'll shut it down. Uh, Henry Boyter Jr., Spartanburg, South Carolina. Dutch, we know how it works, but who had the most painful chop when delivered, uh, rightly or wrongly? Did you ever receive or give a chop that had a message behind it? So, hardest chop in the business, uh, you definitely feel it. Well, I didn't take chops too well. I didn't like chops. The hardest chop when he was pissed off was Andre. Really? Andre, I, I saw him knock a guy completely almost out of the ring. He knocked him back into the ropes, and the ropes hadn't have been there. He just knocked him co- completely from the middle of the ring, out of the ring, in the air. Because he got pissed off at the guy. See, Andre had a little bit of a temperament to him. You catch him in a bad mood, he'll knock crap out of you. So... And yeah, a lot of guys could throw the hard chop. I never liked throwing it. Well, I, but I was an equal opportunity user because I didn't take them and I didn't throw them. If it's going to hurt, don't do it. That's not the purpose of wrestling in my book. I mean, if you got a, those guys in Japan, if they went out there and them making big money and everybody was doing it, yeah, I'd probably do it. Don't mean I would like it. You ever been chopped? No, oh, yeah. Does it sting? Well, now, but sting. I was in school, and, though. I mean, they didn't have, like, real power behind it. That's what I'm saying. So put a little power behind it and a sting, and you'll be a, you'll be a lover of it. You just walk up to people out of the clear blue on the street and say, you mind chopping the hell out of me right here? <laughs> Said, I enjoy that so much. Yeah, a lot of guys could chop your heart if you stay there for it. Bob Armstrong would do it. Oh, yeah? 
Oh, they'd hurt like hell. <laughs> but I only did it because that was it. That was his deal. He didn't throw punches. He threw chops. So I'd have to take them, but he would lighten up on me a little bit. And I would say, thank you very, very much. Thank you. So I thought you were going to say Wahoo. The hardest oh, job. Well, Wahoo, he and Valentine, I've heard that I've never been around one of their matches, but I heard that the boys would stay behind. They were always on last every night. They would stay behind just to watch them beat the crap out of each, each other. And while Valentine got over, and remember, I've I've compared Gunther mm -hmm. to a modern day Valentine because mm -hmm. he would take his time. He wouldn't even take a deep breath at least fifteen minutes in. He would he he would have a very slow moving match. So, and him and Wahoo when they started throwing those chops, boy that that light that crowd up, and you could hear them. Go now, big the building was, but I don't care how big it was. You could still hear it in the top. And they literally, I don't know how they they, they took it, because they were hitting each other so hard, they were leaving bruises and purple marks all over themselves. It was crazy. Let me tell you a story about Johnny Valentine. He was a hell of a rib guy. Is this the inhaler one? Because we talked. Yep, I'll yeah, I'll tell you this. Yeah, we've we've talked about this not too long ago. Oh wow! But yeah. Uh, in fact, I'll say on the YouTube channel, just search Johnny Valentine. You will find that story. I, I promise you'll find it in uh in our uh, uh, archives. Just sticking with the ch uh, chops very uh, quickly. Who gave the chops that looked devastating but didn't really hurt? Nobody. No. No. Hey, you you know you can only. You can only get the sound if, sound if it connects. So if you threw it, all you got to do is miss one, and then people say, nah, bullshit. But Valentine never missed one. Wahoo never missed one. So, and they, they drew, they drew, they would base their big shows off the heat between Wahoo and Valentine. That Wahoo was over, because he's been over everywhere he went. Because he had the Indian, the Indian gimmick, and he, and he was a real Indian. It wasn't anything that he adopted the uh, just just the gimmick. He was a real Indian. So I think he's from Oklahoma. Hmm. I forgot. He told me one day. You can tell how interested I was. I, I, I forgot <laughs> it by now. But but him and Valentine they do nothing but money. He was. I'm going to try and very quickly find. It. He was. Um... He was born in a small town of Bernice, Louisiana in 1938. There you go. Uh, right, on that note, I think we better close it off. So thank you, everybody, for sending in your questions. If you want to send in a question for a future episode, questions for Dutch at gmail.com. Uh, I didn't celebrate our Pro Wrestling Tees, uh, Pro Wrestling Tees uh, T-shirts that you can buy right now. Links are in the description. And as we say, books and all the signed stuff from Dutch. Dirty Dutchman, tell with two L's at gmail.com. But once again, questions for Dutch at gmail.com. If you want to submit a question for future consideration, we will see you again on Friday for story time. But for now, Dutch, we the people. We the people. <laughs>